So let's go now to our new, next keynote presentation, which is about taming the ransomware store. Our guest is Richard Mayers, who's the Director of Security Technology and Strategy for EMEA at Akamai. Uh, hi, Richard, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me on, Marcus. Right, Richard, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome to this presentation by Akamai, uh, the world's most distributed sort of cloud services provider. Um, I want to start this off with a number for you. Have you got any idea what this relates to? Is it the number of bot attacks, for example, that we saw last year? Or is it the number of DNS queries you may see uh, in the world in a single day? Well, does that make it any easier, $10.5 trillion? Well, this is the estimated value of cybercrime in the world in 2025, as declared by Albania's Prime Minister, Eddie Rama, at the World Economic Forum Conference in Davos back in January. And that makes it the third largest economy in the world after the USA and China. So for defenders, this shows us the scale of the challenge that we're up against. And for attackers, it gives them a great, incentive, great incentive. Now, every security presenta presentation should have, a, have a, a, an inspiring quote. So I, I found this one and it's, it ain't about how hard you hit, it is about how hard you can get hit. And that, of course, was by the great philosopher Rocky Balboa. Now, we know we're going to get hit as defenders. We know we're going to get hit a lot by various types of attacks, and they're going to keep on pounding us. But the important bit about this quote was the, is the last bit, which is, and keep moving forward. Otherwise, we're just going to be taking more and more punches and not responding. We're not growing. So this means that we need to build our applications, build our access, build our data, in a resilient way that enables our business to succeed in spite of the challenges that are thrown at us. And we need to look at our tools and how they can help us manage, survive and thrive in the modern cybersecurity arena. So a mantra which cybersecurity circles uh, is always talked about is patch, patch and patch, you know, as soon as possible. Um, However, in a recent Gartner paper, there was this quote, which is, through 2026, non-patchable attack surfaces will grow from less than 10% to more than half of the enterprise's total exposure. This is going to hugely reduce the impact of automated remediation practices. So this is a pretty huge amount that we have to manage and mitigate now. So we need to ensure what we are using to protect our attack surfaces and our assets is backed up with flexible, reliable engineering and intelligence to ensure continued protection. So we can sort of see this as exposure management or our attack surface. What can we see when we look inwardly at ourselves from the internet? And actually, what is it visible internally inside our networks? And there are many tools and processes that can help with this, you know, things like Showdown, search engine for the internet, where we can show all the IP addresses, for example, where RDP is exposed to the internet. Top tip, it shouldn't be ever. But when we think of our exposure, our attack surface, these are the assets that we have that are exposed out to the internet. And this sort of includes B2B apps, our B2C apps, our email services, our VPN services, maybe SaaS services, data centers. Suddenly our exposure looks really large and we now have a really big target for the attackers to aim at. So from an attacker's perspective, what are my options? Well, depending on their motivation, they may choose to go for a, a DDoS attack, you know, DDoS for ransom or something like that, or an application level attack, or most commonly for ransomware, a phishing attack. So attackers can leverage phishing as a service kits now to optimize their campaigns. But they always rely on the fact that users are going to click. If we think of users as part of our risk assessment and how their devices are used as part of your exposure, how well are those users protected? 
There were a slew of high profile breaches last year when enterprise users were socially engineered um, to bypass MFA controls and give access to organizations and their, and their key assets. So this example here is, yeah, and three things give this away as being fake. Um, the first is that BA wouldn't obviously give you these for free, but can you spot what the other two would be? If you spotted that, take a bow, because most people don't spot it. And they will probably may say it's the HTTP and not HTTPS, which would be another good indicator, but a dot underneath the A, that's all it is. It looks pretty convincing. It's one pixel difference from a legitimate, legitimate domain. How many of your users would actually fall for that? Or realistically, when you're scrolling through all of your WhatsApp text or your emails on your mobile phone, are you going to be able to spot a pixel difference? And when we start looking at all those users are going to click, this is where we started getting some data at Akamai. We, we see about 7 trillion DNS requests every single day. So we've got a fair amount of data that we can play with. And we looked at all of the DNS requests from protected devices um, that we, we cover. And we came up with some pretty startling and worrying data. In that Q4 last year, we hit 20%. That meant the one in five devices uh, that were sitting behind us were reaching out to either a phishing site, a malware site, or a C2 site at least once in that corner, quarter. At least once in that quarter. That's one in five. When we broke that down for the C2 servers, and a C2 server, not a phishing email that we saw in the previous slide, a C2 is command and control. This is the machine is already compromised. It's reaching out for its next instructions. When we broke that down by into enterprises, we found out that one in eight enterprises were reaching out to a command and control server. One in eight. And then when we looked at breaking that down into in the actual verticals, we saw that 30% of the organizations with malicious command and control traffic were in the manufacturing se sector. Now, that sector might not be as far along the security evolutionary journey as some other verticals, such as financial services or commerce. And the pandemic and ongoing ITOT convergence is creating a lot of issues that still need to be addressed in that vertical. But what was also concerning was the business services was in second place. And as I'm sure everyone is aware of the breach of MoveIt um, that was used for file transfers and many organizations, um, not least a payroll company called Zealous was, was impacted. And consequently, their customers were impacted as well with some big names in the UK being impacted such as Boots and the BBC. This is another example or reminder that the digital supply chain risk and how we need to be aware of where and how our data is stored. And when we overlaid that data um, onto some of, of DNS discovery, back to a ransomware review that we did of the Conti attack group last year, what we found was that it was they had the same level of success as a ransomware group um, across, the, across the verticals. It almost um, matched it perfectly. And Conti, if you're not familiar with them, was one of the most successful ransomware groups operating in 2021. And they broke up early in 2022 due to a disagreement of the conflict in Ukraine. And they had a very efficient model of operation, much like a franchise system where new operators were given a how-to guide of how to compromise an organization. I mean, they had even had a CEO. You know, that 10 point fire trend has got to be hit somehow. But the correlation between what Conti were doing and the DNS that we saw, the data we saw, especially impacting the verticals, was very clear. And when we look at it from an application and API attacks, I think the, the numbers uh, of what's been happening in the last two and a half years is exceedingly interesting. And it shows the, the pivot in the attackers. If we scroll back to January 2021 on the left-hand side, SQL injection attack is the most dominant vector. This is a very common attack vector. It's been the most common attack vector for years. It really is myfirsthack.com. It's what most people try and do when they're trying to hack. Easy to get um, advice on YouTube and whatever, and it's easy to test and easy to get results. But the most you're ever going to get is a database. And it might just be a user database. 
what attackers are now looking for is a bit more payback, a bit more cash. And they can do that by ransomware. And to get ransomware, they need to go onto the network. And this is where the other two um, uh, colors in there below that, the dark, sort of dark blue and the light blue, give you local file inclusion um, and cross-site scripting. And when you look at those two, those are really taken off because those are the ones that can give you the opportunity to, to get a bridgehead onto the network. So what we need to do is reduce the opportunity, reduce the risk. And we need to look at how we can address the obvious attack vectors, DDoS, application attacks against our websites, and crucially, APIs. Four out of every five requests on the Akamai platform is an API request. And we see about a third of the internet every day. Four out of every five. So you need to be affording the same level of security to your APIs as you are to your web apps. So we focus on our external facing web and our internet assets and deploying effective web application and firewalls is a must. But what about your users? You know, we just saw how effective phishing can be. How protected are they against these types of attacks? How protected are they from social engineering attacks? The modern office worker has three days in the office, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays normally. And we all know that makes for a splendid acronym. But what are they doing for the other two days? They're working from home or wherever. It doesn't really matter. But we've gone from an environment where everyone was in the office to a situation where 40% of the time, your users are on an untrusted network with all manner of IoT equipment. And the DNS data that we just saw echoed how dangerous that was. So one of the things we can look to do is something called Zero Trust Network Access, or ZTNA. It's a great way to reduce the exposure of your users. This allows them to work from anywhere, inherent security and performance benefits over legacy network architectures, far further than just remote access. If we look at the traditional scenarios here, we see that once the user on the left has connected on their VPN, they essentially have the same level of network access as the user on the right. Except as we discussed before, the network the user on the left is using, the one with all the IoT, there's a good chance it's gonna be compromised. 20% remember we could be saw. How can we make it so the user on the left can access the applications on the right in a more secure, more flexible and more scalable way? By abstracting the authentication out to the cloud, out to the cloud proxy, we can reduce any unauthenticated attacks. In addition, as it's proxied, there is no IP level access to the application from the end user. If you do an Nmap from the remote user, you'll just see the proxy infrastructure and not the assets you want to attack. The next is authorization. If I reduce the amount of devices the user is permitted to access, then their exposure risk is reduced. This is essentially least privilege in the same way that we've been talking about for 30 years. Think about how many apps in your organization, but how many do you actually use? Is it 2%, 5%? And similarly for our cloud apps as well, it doesn't really matter where the app is, it's just going through the proxy, so it's transparent to the end user. So now we've done a big chunk out of that exposure. And another part of understanding our exposure is understanding what assets we actually have. What do we actually have running in our network? How many PCs, servers, IoT cameras, printers, VMs, containers? How that list is maintained and curated is vital to reducing your exposure. If you can only see what half of your devices are doing, you're going to have no idea what the exposure is of the rest. So we need to make the target smaller. Things like your email server should not be visible to the internet for things like webmail. You should not be able to RDP to a Windows server direct from the internet. And don't think that sticking all this behind a VPN is going to solve those issues. So a good way to reduce your exposure is to look at all of your external facing apps, your B2B apps, the apps your users rely on. And remember that if we do things like ZTNA, users are gonna have no access to the network. They're just accessing the app. So they have no IP level connectivity. And then with ZTNA, the users are only able to access the apps they're authorized to access. And then our users are protected from compromise, from clicking on those links, wherever they are working from. So this has reduced our exposure, not completely, but 
it has reduced it to a point where there's still going to be areas within uh, with so it has been uh, accessible to the internet within our estate, but we have reduced it significantly, and we've made that target much much smaller to hit. So we've reduced the target, but the attackers are still going to try many different routes to get access to your assets. You know, an insider threat, for example, 61% of organizations have seen in the last year. What happens if you're compromised through your legitimate su supply chain? And this is why assumed breach is beginning to get a lot of credibility. And this means acting like you have been breached. What would happen if you were breached today? What would you do? This doesn't mean it's not being fatalistic. I mean, yes, the chances of an organization being compromised in some way is highly likely. But rather than trying to take a reactionary approach, we need to be proactive and decide what we can do to make the breach as painless as possible. And this is a key principle behind which all submarines are designed. You know, if you've ever watched any underwater movies, you've always seen clips of submariners frantically closing doors and securing bulkheads due to a part of the, the hull being damaged by a fire or a gas leak or something like that, by compartmentalizing the affected area to the smallest piece possible. Restricting access, venting the fire of the gas, they are quickly able to restore the boat. Without the bulkheads, any small incident can jeopardize the whole crew. So we need to think the same for networks. A breach that can be contained by compartmentalizing is great, but not at the VLAN, not at the network level as the collateral damage could still be enough to take down the ship or take down the business. We need to compartmentalize at the workload level, and then the incident can, can potentially become almost trivial. And then in the cyber world, we know there are many actions that can be taken after a breach. In a recent webinar, I did some questions, I asked some people, 23% that said they would do this. The top answer was actually switching everything off. So there are better ways of how we need to do that. And that's about compartmentalization at the workload level. If we can make those smart and understand the traffic flows, we're able to give us great visualization. One of the big obstacles that many organizations face is they don't actually have a clear view of the activity across all of their on-prem and cloud environments. If we're able to give that visualization, map relationships and dependencies between all of the entities on your cloud and on your on-prem, we're able to do a lot more with understanding what our traffic flows are. What is, uh, you know, we can look at the maps, we can look at the policies, we can understand what our traffic flows and be in a better position to segment um, the good from the bad, from our dev, from our prod, uh, and understand our traffic flows. So now we've created a network where our internet exposure is reduced, protected as much as possible, and we have micro-segmented our network to ensure the malicious traffic cannot traverse the internal network. We've also got a real-time view into all of our IT and OT assets that allows us to manage risk far more effectively and mitigate unforeseen risk far more quickly. If we can reduce the opportunity as much as possible, we can reduce the risk and hopefully be able to bring that $10.5 trillion, bring that figure down just a little. So with that, um, I'd just like to sort of cover a couple of things we talked about. We talked about zero trust network access, secure web gateways, micro segmentation, multi-factor authentication, app and API protection. If you're interested in any of those topics, please visit us at akamai.com. And if you'd like to reach out to me, my details are on the screen. Thank you very much. Fantastic, Richard. That's great. Really appreciate that. Really interesting. Um, unfortunately, we're really uh, uh, tight on time, but I would just like to circle back to the idea of uh, zero trust, which you sort of highlighted there at the, end, at the end. When organizations are looking at implementing zero trust, should they be looking at zero trust for all of their assets? What would you say? Ideally, yes, but realistically, most organizations have got very complex infrastructures. They've got a huge amount of assets. It's basically working out is where's your risk? You know, if, if you have lots of users who are remote, accessing core assets all the time, that would be a good place to start. What are those assets that, are, that all your users are accessing? If you can deliver that via Zero Trust, that's a good way of reducing your risk massively um, and creating a, and also it enables your users to get access to those applications even more easily and sometimes even quick, more quickly as well. I think if we can you know, probably 
type of one more very quickly. This idea of micro segmentation you highlighted it at the end. How, how does that work when you're looking at an organisation that's that's got legacy operating uh, systems and, and, and OT? Well, micro segmentation should have the ability. It's commonly done in two ways. It's it's commonly done either as an agent on the device. So you need to have uh, ensure that if it's working in the cloud, is it working with Kubernetes? If it's working on prem, is it working with your um, virtual machines? Is it also working with your laptops? Is it working with your servers? Is it working with your Solaris boxes and your Windows XP machines? Especially if you go back into manufacturing, as we saw, there's a very long tail in some of those uh, some of those companies. Um, but it also needs to work with OT as well. And that's where you're sort of looking at network traffic and understanding sort of the signatures that a lot of the OT devices um, are portraying and, and displaying. And if you can get the visibility into the OT, bring that into the micro segmentation world, um, especially with agents for a lot of legacy uh, devices as well, that ensures you get that complete visibility. Fantastic. Richard, really appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much indeed, Marcus.